This program is brought to you by Stanford University. Please visit us at stanford.edu. This presentation is delivered by the Stanford Center for Professional Development, providing graduate level education to working professionals online, on campus, and on site. For more information, please visit study.stanford.edu. Uh, this week we have Ken Goldberg from UC Berkeley, and um, I really enjoy having him here. He's spoken before because he cuts across so many of the different interests. Um, he's sort of equally at home in really hardcore technology, um, art, uh, social sciences, philosophy. I first got to know of him through his work, this, the book here called The Robot in the Garden, which he edited, but it, the, on the cover, what you see here, I'll put it down, you can put it on the camera. Um, just, just leave it there. Say hello. Um, <laughs> the eye from the sky. Um, um, this is a very early experiment with mixing the physical and the virtual and the teleoperation. So people could actually get onto the internet and plant things in this physical garden using this robot arm. So anybody anywhere in the world had access to planting and watering. Uh, and that led to a whole series of philosophical questions about presence and distance, a series of further experiments with uh, more ambiguous cases where you looked like you were doing something in the real world, but you couldn't be sure. Um, and that's the kind of exploration that Ken does, sort of he puts something together that crosses these all and then lets himself and other people react to them and understand what's, what they're in depth. His latest experiment in that, and I hope he'll also share some of the earlier ones as well, uh, is in the area of biology. So. Without further ado, great. Thank you, Terry. Actually, we have in common a, um, uh, a, a connection because of uh, Hubert Dreyfus, who's been an influence on both of us and uh, his work and looking at analysis of computers from a philosophical perspective has been a big inspiration over the years. Um, thank you, Terry, and uh, I also want to thank Scott for, for having me down here. I've been a, um, hopefully a friend of this uh, HCI program for a number of years, and um, I have a new position well, I shouldn't announce it yet. It's actually not, it's not official, but um, I'll be doing more activities uh, related to, our, to uh, new media at Berkeley starting in the, uh, starting this summer. So um, does this sound okay? Does this sound a little? Okay. It's like Tuvian throat singing or something. Um, I'll try that a little later. Uh, so I want to go over some, I'll give a background of some past works, and particularly I want to show you a, um, a project we did last year, uh, a ballet. And then I'll switch over and talk about the, the work we're doing right now that I'm very excited about with, with biology. So um, let's see. This is, this is sort of mostly a joke, really, but uh, it was the idea of um, uh, it's Madame Blavatsky there. The, the idea of I'm just interested in this whole general topic of, uh, of, of, of media, and in particular, this last part, um, the, the distance. So when you're connecting to um, scenarios, uh, over some kind of a distance. Now, this is um, an early example of this. This is a remote control device. Um, this is an ad from the 1950s. It's a little hard to read here, but it says, absolutely harmless to humans. Uh, so uh, this was, you know, in the first days, it was like the era of ray guns and stuff like that. And remote control was a little bit uh, frightening. But I still think everybody gets a little bit of a thrill when you just have something in your hand. You press a button, and things happen. Um, and there's many examples. Uh, this is the. Sojourner, of course, the famous telerobot on, on Mars. My background is in robotics, so I, I grew up making things and putting together robotic systems and, and analyzing them. I uh, became interested in telerobots only fairly recently, in, in the last decade. Um, this is a famous example, and it's a very successful one uh, from NASA on Mars. And the idea here, though, is it's a class of robots that are controllable at a distance. And there's a long history of these, and it goes back over 100 years. And this is Tesla had developed a beautiful um, remote controlled boat. And this is back in the early days of radio. So radio is brand new. Most people hadn't really experienced that. And then he originally, right away, started uh, realizing he could control devices over it. So there's, there, uh, there's a long history. People have been doing research. It's still a very active area. The big problems there, of course, are time delays and user interfaces and 
Um, and and there's, there's a journal, Presence Journal, that's devoted to teleoperation. And I think of this as something that's very fundamentally human. In fact, it's something, it's an instinctive behavior that we do, we begin even before we, we learn to uh, talk. So, you know, in this case, um, you know, the operator is driving the telerobot, um, and uh, we, you know, you, you want to be able to go out and see things and do things and, and activate things in the environment. Um, so it's a very human instinct. So what I'm going to talk about is a number of experiments and projects uh, I'll cover. I'm going to kind of zip through them, but, um, and I'll give you the ballet more first, and then we're going to go back to Cone, because that's the one I'm, uh, I'm, I'm working on now. We have some new results. So my first foray into teleoperation was in 1992, and this was a, a very primitive device um, that we built. Uh, sort of, it was an artwork, and kind of a, intended as a little bit of a spoof on, on virtual reality, uh, which was all the rage at the time. So what we did was we put this simple device together, and it was a, a plexiglass tube with a, with a ball inside of it. And when you put your hand inside of this, when you squeeze the ball, it sends a one-bit signal out over the wire to a, to a modem. And then on the other end was another arrangement, a similar, a symmetrical arrangement. So when the other person squeezed the ball at their end, these little solenoids would activate, and it would, that way two people could hold hands over the phone. So the idea was, uh, that was the idea. When we started um, prototyping it, we realized that we had failed to properly ground these solenoids. <laughs> so uh, there was a, a large electrical arc. And every time you know, someone, we would try this, the involuntary reaction was to just rip the hand out of the device. And that became more interesting to us than the original, uh, the original idea. So um, anyway, but that was, we exhibited that in a few places. And, and then, and this was 92. And then like, you know, out of nowhere, it seemed, the web just took off. And it was this great, I mean, we all take it for granted now, but it was this real moment of, and, and I think it just a great set of, of primitives, or just the right balance of, um, of, of level of detail. And it was open source. It was very easy to jump in and play yourself. And this, this happened in about 93. And um, we, one of the things that we were excited about uh, early on was that you could, of course, you get access to images and text. And there was nice formats and lots and lots of material coming out very fast. But one of the things that caught our eye was this idea of cameras, that uh, you could also access the physical world over this thing. So um, this was one of the first ones, the uh, very famous Cambridge coffee pot, where two grad students did a hack where they wanted to check that the coffee pot was full before they went down to the student lounge so it wouldn't waste their time otherwise. And uh, of course, now we know there's millions of webcams that are out there. But when we saw this uh, in late 93, we, 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 had, we, we thought, OK, well, could we do it? Could we extend that even further? In other words, not just look at something live in the world, but actually manipulate using a robot arm. And so that gave us the idea of what we call the Mercury Project. And the idea there was we had an arm in the lab, a robot arm, and this was um, January 94, and we were just coming back to school. I had a Sandlot group of uh, very core uh, undergrads and grads who were, we got really excited about the idea of we're going to put the first robot on the web. So we started working, and it was pretty much around the clock. Um, we, we had to instrument this thing. We started thinking about what should we do. We thought, well, you know, we stack blocks, but that was boring. And besides, people would pick up blocks and jam them into each other and do all kinds of you know, mischief. So we thought, Let's do something where you couldn't really get into too much trouble. So we decided to make it the, the, the objective to be digging in a sandbox. And we put a, a, a nozzle, an air nozzle, on, one of the, on the arm. And then we put a camera on the end. And then we buried a bunch of artifacts in the sand. And we made a sand, our own little sandbox. And we, then we opened this up. And this was the, the website. So this is August of 94. And we, were, we didn't know it, but there was another team that was in Australia that was racing against us. And we beat them just by a couple of weeks. Uh, they had a, actually a very cool robot, too. But um, we, uh, we put this online, and we had a, uh, um, this is a robot base, and this is a, the sandbox, and this is, a, this is where the camera is, and then this is what the camera's seeing. So we had a few pages explaining how to use it, and then you would come in. And so once you got it, your turn, this is, it looks really primitive now because it was HTML 1.0. There was no JPEG. Um, you couldn't do JPEG images. This is GIFs. But it allowed you to um, click uh, around here on the right, on the schematic image, and that, and thereby, um, once you clicked, it would move the robot arm to that location, take a new image, and send it back. So you're able to look around, kind of like a, a, a mobile webcam. But then for us, what was most important was this button here, the red. Because then, if you clicked on that, it would blow a one-second burst of compressed air into the sand. So you could dig. 
So this was the first time that you could actually move things around over there from your desktop. Yep. Ah, good question. So people on the net had no idea. We actually had this story, backstory, where we said we were looking for this, um, this radioactive site in Nevada. So some people thought it was miles long. Uh, <laughs> and then, but it was about like this. Yeah, it was just a little bit. But um, yeah, we've used, and then there was all these, 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 these questions that you don't really think about, like what, what do you put in there? We had sand in, but the sand would, um, was a problem because it was out, there was too much dust particles, so we ended up with a combination of cat litter and uh, those little crumbled up peanuts that you get in delivery sometimes. Um, so that's kind of what you're looking at there. But um, it became very popular, and this was really uh, exciting to us because people were coming in pretty much around the clock. And we would come in on, on the morning, and all the sand would be blown off to one side. So we really got energized by this, and it was a lot of fun. And um, I can spend a lot of time. We can I can talk more about this if we have time. But um, as Terry said, one of the most surprising things that came up was someone wrote and said, "Well, how do I know there's a sandbox there at all? I mean, how do I know there's a robot?" And you know, it could be faked, right? You could just do a pretty elaborate hack by just taking a bunch of still photographs and then making an indexing database, and there's no robot. And I got really interested in that. So that, that was, um, um, I, that's still sort of driving a lot of, um, one of my big interests. But our next project was to, to take that a step further. So we, we got energized by the, the popularity of the site and the students wanted to do bigger, more elaborate. So we wanted a color camera and a better robot. And so we thought, well, rather than just build another sandbox, we'll take the next evolutionary step into agriculture. So that's why we, we said, okay, we'll have a plant, we'll grow a plant. So we, we built a, this bigger, thing um, called the telegarden, and uh, we had a better industrial arm in there, and uh, it had um, color and all kinds of nice interfaces, interfacing aspects, and so you could, you could move around. And so in this case, not just digging, you, could, um, you would be able to water the plants, but you could also, after you've watered 50 times, and you were then, you know, we would reward you with your first seed, so you could plant a seed. You decide where you want to plant it, and then the robot will go in and do it, and let's see if this works. So there's a, um, um, this thing had some pneumatics. It's got a little headlight on there because you gotta give plants darkness at night. We learned the hard way. Um, but you'll see it sort of digs down and moves the soil away. And then it's just picked up a seed from this little pile. And then it uh, drops the seed down and waters it at the end. Let's see. Yeah, it's a little hard to see there. But, um, and then, of course, nothing happened. So you have to come back. And, you, and the whole idea of this was to engage people. And it was, on one hand, really, we meant it as an art project to sort of point out the absurdity of you know, gardening over the internet. Um, and then on the other hand, we were interested in the social kind of experiment. Like, what would people do um, with, a, with a system like this? And it was interesting. People really would come back. A uh, certain core of people would spend a lot of time there. And they would nurture their plants. And they would, when they went on vacation, they would send mail to this chat room we had and say, would anybody be willing to water my plants while I'm away? And, all this kind of thing. Um, but even there, there was a question. Well, is that real or not? And <clears throat> so I became interested in this distinction um, between virtual reality and uh, what we might call distal reality. That is, in virtual reality, clear, you're working in a, in a synthetic system. It might be you know, various degrees of reality, but it's, it's in the computer. It's, not, it's fiction. Whereas in distal reality, it's real somewhere. It just happens to be somewhere else. Now, from your, when you're doing an interface to a digital reality system, again, your, your medium there is the computer screen. So the question is, well, how are you able to distinguish between these two categories? And you know, as Hubert Dreyfus and, uh, it sort of explained, that's a very old question. That's, that's a, a really um, uh, question of epistemology. What can we know? And so I became interested in this idea of telepistemology, which is what can you know at a distance? Uh, what's knowable, and it's relevant to a lot of a lot of things. Even I mean, re remember there's a huge re re revolution in, in epistemology when Descartes, um, and the, it, it responds to the era of telescopes because they completely change what we know, namely that the uh, you know there are moons of Jupiter, things like that. That really, and, and today we're we're learning things about planets and other solar systems. So technologies like this can actually not only um, provide more convenience and functionality and entertainment, but they also really can change fundamentally what we know and what, what, what is knowledge. So um, then I became interested, and this is about the time I moved to Berkeley, I became really interested in pushing these boundaries and thinking about these questions about um, perception and knowledge. And um, I worked with, uh, with Eric Paulos and um, 
survival research labs on this project we call Legal Tender. And here the idea was um, inspired some degree by the, the Milgram experiments with a voltage, applying voltage to the subjects. Um, and we wanted to think if we could take that same idea and translate it to the internet. Um, obviously, you don't want to do it literally because there's some ethical issues there. But uh, we, we made a, this project, program where we said, um, we, we announced a telerobotic laboratory. And so anybody could come in and we put $200 bills there. And you could take an image, we had an image from each, and you would, we would said, okay, well, you can, um, you're going to, if you are willing, you sign up to participate and you would help us determine which is which. And so once you did that, you, we sent you a password and then you're given a, um, a sector from one of the two bills. And uh, then you're given the option of one of these tests to perform. You could just zoom in a little closer, puncture, thermal. Okay. And 95% like of the people who signed up uh, selected the uh, thermal test, which is to burn a hole in the bill. Uh, but after you did that, you were, we sent a, um, the next image was a, uh, a reminder that, uh, oh, by the way, it's a federal law to, against uh, defacing currency. And, you know, if you now we have your email address, you know, are you, are you understand your wish to uh, proceed. And interestingly, almost everybody said yes. Uh, <laughs> uh, what? No, that's right. That was pre Hoban. That's a very good point. That was 1997, uh, pre uh, pre security. But anyway, the the um, I became interested then in this uh, also at, in this idea of multiple ways of um, in in the interactions between people over the net. Because in, in in all these systems, in some degree, you are interacting with a site, a physical site, but you are also interacting with other people through the site. Like whether it's a garden, right? You are planting. And, and, and actually, the social dynamic became really interesting to me that, what about that? Can we push that further? And um, so we started thinking about this idea of collaborative control. That is, letting a number of people control something simultaneously. So in other words, like the garden was one, each person at a time, or actually, they were multitasking. But what if you really let them interact at the same time? And that, then we had an opportunity to do a, an, an, another art project. So we brainstorming, we said, well, let's do a Ouija board. And uh, Ouija board is kind of like that if you think about it, right? You put your hands on this thing, it's many people controlling one device simultaneously. Um, and it's also interesting from an art perspective, I, I, I like the idea of the Ouija board as a kind of commentary on uh, technology. Um, this, was the, this was really, I think, a response to the development of the telephone and the, and the um, radio because it came out around the turn of the 19th century and it was because um, people thought, well, if you can suddenly, you know, pick up this device and listen to a distant and unseen voice. It didn't seem so far-fetched that, you know, there's a mechanism to talk to the dead. So, um, so we built this thing, and then, you know, we have a robot and, uh, and a lab, but the interface to it was that you come to this website, and it tells you to take your computer, mouse, your keyboard, and move it away from your screen. And then place your, move your mouse and your mouse pad in front of the computer screen. And then turn out the lights in your home or office. And then place the hands on the screen, on the mouse, um, and now you're in a position to start playing. And so what you get is this uh, live interface here that tracks your motion um, with a Java applet. But then what's interesting is that it shows you who else is playing at any given time and um, asks you a, a question. Everybody gets the same question that they're all sharing. And these were generic questions tied to the turn of the 21st, 20th century, um, the millennium. And um, then you're all supposed to concentrate and try and answer that question. So, and then it w the, you were streaming back your mouse movements to our central server w that was then averaging them over all the users that were active. And then we would use that to control the real um, robot in the lab. Um, okay, so I can talk more about some of these projects uh, if, uh, you know, as we go. Stop me anytime. But I want to go back to the bigger picture of networked robots. So we started thinking, OK, what other things can we do with these? Because moving around, I, I really like this idea of the, the interaction between people um, simultaneously, kind of engaging them. But I thought, well, it gets boring moving around on a game board, right, just with a bunch of letters and numbers. So it doesn't limit it to what you can do there. So we started thinking, well, what if we can actually go out and move around, use a similar kind of interface, but move around in the physical world, and go out and see things, and do things, and interact with people there. So then we thought, well, we'll get a robot, of course, and we'll have this mobile robot zipping around. And, I thought, well, we're going to spend a lot of time getting the mobile robot, batteries, and making sure you know we have to, the getting it to work and everything. So we said, well, 
we don't really care about that so much, so let's not worry about the robot. We'll just have a human, and we'll, the human will sort of be the robot. So we came up with this idea of the teleactor, and the idea there is we have a person who is out there responding to people over the internet. And they have a microphone and video, and it's, a, it's an interactive system. The reason we chose actor is that the, the, it's not a slave, like a, the tele, you know, the, the person isn't just taking orders. The person is um, interpreting direction that's coming in over the net. So people are giving input, but the person is responding and interpreting and hopefully having fun. And um, I went to, I worked with Judith Denoth and some of her students at the Media Lab for a, um, a sabbatical, and we came up with this new interface, um, spatial dynamic voting, where people who place these small um, markers, whoops, oh, I didn't even know I could do that with this button. Um, uh, you place these small markers on the screen, and then you could help, th those would be read by the teleactor who could then determine where to go or what to do. And um, we had a lot of fun with this thing. We took it out to a bunch of different places, Exploratorium, Art Openings. Um, this was a, we, we had it at the fifth annual Webby Awards, which was at the Opera House in San Francisco. And um, we got to, uh, we, this was the teleactor. Um, she has the, gla the and here is a, um, it's a wireless um, video camera. You can see she's got the, the headpiece and everything. And uh, the, this is Sam Donaldson. So he was the MC that night, and she was going to come out for like a very short one-minute interaction um, to demonstrate this technology. And I had to, I had like 30 seconds to explain to him what part of the, this piece of the show. So I, I said, well, okay, we have this new technology we're just developed, and she's going to come out, and she's got um, she's wired up with uh, you know with 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 information, and um, she's going to be getting uh, information out over the network, and they're going to be telling her what to do. And he said, wait a second. That's what I do. <laughs> um, so they had a really fun interaction, and he ended up, they had the first telehug and this whole thing. So, um, and anyway, but we, we were really interested in this idea that you know, people were interacting with each other over the net. They were able to go to a space they couldn't otherwise go, like a private party or a backstage or some kind of um, interaction. Let's just see what it's like to be on stage with somebody you know, at, this, at the opera house. Okay, so around this time, um, this is 2000, and, 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 and you, know, you mentioned the 9-11. So 9-11 ha happens, and it's a, it, it is a big effect. And I think that this is relevant to this kind of, these technologies. And, and I took it to heart and, and started thinking about it also. And I was interested in, you know, how could we react to something like this? And um, so w one of the things I, I looked at was um, an idea that we came to called uh, um, infiltrate. And, I was interested, one of the things that struck me was one of the, the biggest problems we have is being able to see um, from the inside another culture, see the world from inside another culture, another perspective. Uh, it's a very hard thing to do. And <clears throat> so that someone, you know, two people could be experiencing the same phenomena, but some, so completely differently that, that, that they, it's, they're un, un, unrecognizable to each other. So we wanted to say, well, could we think about this in a different context? So I, so I wanted to put... Um, use a technology to be able to get inside the head of someone else. And the idea here was that not a person, um, which is hard enough, but, um, but in this case, uh, a fish. And so uh, what we did was we, um, we set up this system, and, and we had um, six koi fish in a tank, swimming around in a tank, one white and, and five goldfish. And you know, you wanna, so one idea is to put a camera on the head. You know? But this is a problem, because the fish don't like it. And uh, water's bad transmitting wireless signals, and you'd have to have wire. It just wouldn't work. So our idea was then just to put um, three cameras on the um, side of the orthogonal um, placements of, around the tank, and then we could track the motion of the fish and get a three-dimensional motion of each fish, and then we'd recreate the, the few from any one of them. right? So once we have all that information, we can create what that fish is seeing. And the idea is to do that in real time. So um, we built this thing. And um, it was harder than we thought for a couple of reasons. One is that you know the, f the f fish all often are interacting, and so your your tracking loses connections between them, and they're 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 not nice spherical fish. <laughs> um, so, uh, but we were able to do do decently well. But then on the other side of it, the um, projection, and I should mention this was with uh, per Pedro Perona, who's at Caltech, and some of his students. So they're experts in bio tracking biological systems. So uh, we had that benefit. But on our side, we were doing the, the, the display, and it was very hard because um, 
the, uh, when you're projecting the, the synthetic image, um, a lot of times we get this just blank, blank screen. And we, look, we were like, what are we doing wrong here? And um, we finally realized that what it was is, no, we were actually, the fish was just staring out of the tank. There were no other fish in the field of view. But so you were just seeing a blank. And actually, that was kind of an insight to us. That actually, it's kind of sad. But that's what fish do, is they look at us most of the time. <laughs> Um, so we, we decided we would do, fix that by having like a smoky, somewhat reflective um, aspect to the, to the surface. And then this is what the, uh, the result looks like. Um, this is just a sample that we took out of, the, out of the sequence of the fish. Started swimming around. You get a little seasick from this. But, uh, <laughs> um, but you'll see that, they, see there, there's the reflection. Yeah, they're, seeing, they're, looking at each, they're looking at themselves to some degree with that reflection, but they're also looking out. Um, it's pretty bad, I know. Well, see, also, this is an interesting, because we, we didn't, it was really hard to, you know, usually there's all these toys and stuff in there, like, to look at. But we had to take those out, because it was really hard to get in the way of our interface, so it was especially boring. It was like solitary confinement for these guys. Um, so uh, I'm going to skip this part really quick, because I'm going to come back to it in the context of the, uh, of the, um, of the new project. Oh, no, 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 I'm not. I'm going to tell you about this. This is, so, okay, coming back to 9-11 and the interest in um, um, with the technologi technological perspectives or social perspectives coming out of that, one of the things that, that, that happened, um, as we all know, is, is that it really changed the, the, the attitudes toward privacy and security. So we've had a, a, a real shift, um, a quanti qualitative shift in, in the way we think about these things. And... Um, I, I, probably most of you are familiar with CCTV. This is the program out of um, the UK. But they just passed 4 million cameras are installed all around, not only London, but all kinds of cities around, um, around the countryside. And it started with um, concerns over IRA, uh, uh, terrorist bombings at that time. And then it's expanded it because it's, been, it's had effect on crime. And there's a lot of controversy around this, as you can imagine. Um, one thing that does seem clear is that it, it moves crime. In other words, it doesn't eliminate, but it, crime just moves away from these cameras. Um, but uh, so, but they're, they're, they're almost everywhere. They're ubiquitous um, in, in London. So after the, after the London bombings, um, uh, uh, subway bombings, they were able to go back and get a lot of information uh, about the movement of the, of the individuals. The big problem that a lot of people have, and I think this is really justifiable, is, well, is it a de deterrent in any way? Um, and there's... There's some evidence, actually, that it could work the opposite way, that certain, possibly in gangs, that they actually might see it as an opportunity to sort of, you know, provoke to do something in front of the cameras, like even bigger, uh, a bigger deal. Um, but these cameras are, are, are everywhere, in, in, and they're, uh, this is coming to the, in your own neighborhood, if it hasn't already. Uh, Department of Homeland Security is funding a vast increase in, um, in these kind of programs. So San Francisco, um, Chicago, most major cities are installing them. They're already pretty much um, ubiquitous on, on any kind of freeway or traffic environment. Um, you may not realize, it doesn't seem like any big deal, but Caltrans has all these cameras out there. And when you drive home, I mean, one of the things that is now there's some pressure from the insurance companies because they want to be able to, after there's an accident, they want to say, well, what happened? Let me see. So I can you know, judge. Now it's really... Subtle. And of course, in, in these, you know, with a little bit of uh, image um, enhancement, you can zoom in and, you know, see who's driving and what time they're coming home. And there's all kinds of things. Not to mention Caltrans and other ways of collecting uh, such information. And there's demand across all kinds of scenarios. Not just, um, let's say, banks or airports or um, um, freeways, but all kinds of places people want to put these. Nanny cams. They want to put them, you know, to watch their kid. Um, and it's, uh, it's, it's growing, and this, the industry is responding by making many of these cameras um, systems available. And we're aware that you know, there's all kinds of nice tools now for navigating uh, to get access to, to, to these cameras. And we were interested in the idea that there's two, um, there's, a, there's a new class. So the, we were talking at lunch a little bit about the high-resolution video cameras, high-def um, cameras that are coming out. Um, this is kind of interesting. There's one option is to put a, if you want to monitor a site, you put a, a mirror a dome mirror, and then you can, you can monitor a whole area very quickly. Uh, this is the highest resolution camera that we found, 6 megapixel uh, per frame. It's about $20,000. Um, 
Now this is a this is the class that we're interested in that are robotic cameras, and these are just um, off the sh this is off the shelf. There's a few companies, um, Canon, Sony, uh, Panasonic, who make them, and these are um, pan tilt zoom. So um, this is small, but the size of a grapefruit, and it just uses a standard CCD, but um, you can move it around. So it's the cost of this whole thing is about twelve hundred dollars. Actually, you can get them on eBay now for like five hundred dollars. Um, the thing is, though, that by zooming selectively, you can get within a region of interest uh, 500 times more power than this big industrial system out here. So we saw that as interesting because there was a, a technology that was being used that fit to some degree our model of this idea of a robotic device. Uh, it's not a robot necessarily, but it's a camera, telerobotic camera. And we wanted to think about this model where you have many people out there sharing a camera. So we want to make a camera that's publicly accessible and shared. Um, and one of the problems you come up with is this. You have a, uh, let's say we, we set up a camera like this, and I'll, I'm going to show you some more examples, but this is a, um, the, the framework we came up with was, you, you have a, a generic panorama that you take, and you construct this by simply taking the camera and stepping it through over the field of view, what, it, what you want to see, and then you stitch it together and you get this at the bottom. Now then, the question is now, if, in the interface we have is that you just draw a frame. You come in with your mouse and draw a frame down there. And if, no, if you've got the camera to yourself, the camera dutifully moves over and gives you that nice um, resulting image. But if, um, if, you're, if there's other people in there, then the question is, well, where do you put the camera? So it, it, it's not obvious because you might just average all the requests, and that would put you somewhere in here. Nobody's happy. Um, but we want to come up with a model that will say, well, that's the place to put the camera. That's the best place to put it. And also, when I'm, um, you know, I'm getting these requests very quickly. People are changing their requests, so there's lots of insertions of requests and deletions of requests on the fly. We want to be able to really re quickly recompute an optimum frame. So putting on my computer science hel uh, helmet <laughs> hat, um, it's, uh, this is a frame selection. We call this a frame selection problem. And we said, OK, well, we want to formalize this. We're given the n requests. That's the frames. We want to find the optimal one. And um, it turns out there's some nice related work that we, we looked at, facility location, some operations research, some things from um, uh, geometric databases, uh, and some work in pattern recognition. And we, um, so we drew on that. And here's, the, here's the simple model. And um, just in a few slides, I can give you the flavor of it. It's, uh, you, you have a, a camera that has a fixed aspect ratio. Right? You can't change that. But what you do get to do is move the camera around. So you get to pick the center point. Uh, so that's x, y is in some continuous range. And then the z, the zoom, zoom angle is usually a, um, there's a fixed set. So in, in the Panasonic, it's 12 zoom levels you get to choose. And then these are the frames. So every frame is characterized by three things, its center point and its zoom level. So there's three parameters per frame. And then um, we want to we come up with some measure of satisfaction. So it seems reasonable that at one end of this, when, when, if you requested the white frame and we give you the yellow frame, you, you're not, you, know, you get no satisfaction from that, right? It's completely disjoint, so we give you satisfaction of zero. But if you request this and we give you exactly what you asked for, they're identical, then the satisfaction should be one. So we want some satisfaction that sort of goes reasonably between those two extremes. And um, in the pattern recognition literature, there's a, something that's commonly used called symmetric um, difference, which gives rise to something called intersection over union. You want to look at how much inter intersection is there between those two frames, and you want to penalize it by um, how the, the size of the two frames. Because otherwise, there's a trivial solution, which is just give the maximum frame, because that maximizes intersection. But of course, that's not so good, because you really want something that's, you lose resolution with the big frame. Now, the problem with these are that these are nonlinear functions of, um, of, the, of, the, of the xy variable. So um, Des Song, who was my PhD student, um, came up with a really beautiful um, modification where he said, well, I don't really need to know the intersection. I just need to, to penalize by the maximum of the two frames, which has pretty much the same behavior. But the nice thing is it has a linear, uh, gives you a linear um, uh, function. It's a linear function of x and y. So um, what it gives rise to is these plateaus. So the objective function now, and this is with one frame selected, um, this is telling you what is the objective or the, the, the satisfaction as you move around and consider different placements of a potential frame. And, um, what you do is, so that's for one frame being asked, gives you this objective function. And then you're going to add up from all the requests that come in. And you'll get this landscape, the surface that's generated from the addition, the sum of all of them. 
And so you get something like this, and we want to find the global maximum. So um, we are, uh, it turns out that, uh, as, you, as you might imagine, you know, there's, it's a continuous problem, but there's a discrete, a small, finite set of possible candidate frames that you need to consider. So we, in this order n squared, candidate points, we call them um, plateau vertices, that are when you have the, that are based on all the intersec or intersection points between frames. Um, and then there's some techniques we can borrow from um, some computational geometry, like line sweeping, that allows us to do some of these things more efficiently. Um, we only need to check, um, nice thing is you need to just, because of the linear function, you only need to check it at the endpoints. You don't need to worry about what's happening in the middle. Um, and <coughs> then Des extended this to the continuous zoom case, because it turns out there's also critical zoom values that you need to, to worry about. When, sir, as you expand the zoom level, when it, it touches critical elements in the, in the other um, requests, and you can quickly then track the, the satisfaction function and you make it incremental, so you can compute that uh, very fast too and find the optimum. And in fact, there's a whole set of, of um, results that came out of this. And there are collaborations with different groups, but um, Des and, and I and, and these um, uh, other researchers developed um, algorithms that were exact, um, an approximate, a class of approximate algorithms also, that we could bound the, um, the error as a function of, the, com of the, um, the, the time complexity. And we also did some look at some distributed models, because the idea is if you're out over an internet, why not share the load? Because everybody coming in has got a computer too, so let them help in the computation. Um, okay, so now I'll talk a, just a little bit about this artwork. This was uh, called um, Demonstrate. And here was the idea was we had this technology and we were playing with these cameras and they were surprising us with how powerful they were. So we wanted to put this artwork together that would show that off. Now, there are other people who have looked at surveillance and made artworks around it. Uh, these are a famous, uh, these are a group of play of actors in New York it's called the Surveillance Camera Players. And they go out and they do performances in front of surveillance cameras. And um, this guy, Steve Mann, is very interesting. He, part of his, his PhD work was to build a camera so he wore this camera all the time. So it was on and transmitting, and everybody, he would meet people, and, and they would get uncomfortable, and, and he's, tried to, he, he's tried to take this onto airplanes, and you, know, and that, you can imagine. Um, but he's, he's also he's a really interesting guy. And, um, and then I also want to say that surveillance, we tend to think of as you know, this big brother bad thing. One of the things you also want to keep in mind, though, is that there are cases where having cameras can be a good thing. It can actually help you um, defend yourself against some sort of uh, abuse of power. So there's a, uh, Brian Eno started this thing called Project Witness, which is to give people cameras and video cameras uh, in areas where there's political oppression. So we got the, an invitation from the Whitney Museum in New York to um, do an installation. Um, and the slot they gave us was October of uh, 2006, or sorry, 2004. So we had been thinking about these issues, and um, it just turned out that it was perfectly timed with the anniversary of the free speech movement at Berkeley. So we thought, hmm, so we're interested in privacy, we're interested in, um, you know, uh, the, the First and Fourth Amendment. Why don't we put a camera on Sproul Plaza, the location of the, the free speech movement? Um, now, for, if you don't rem remember this, uh, this scenario, how many of you know about the free speech movement? Okay, it's interesting. I, 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 one of my goals is to keep this, uh, this memory alive because uh, it was a great chapter, I think, because it was, it was 1964. It's really pre-Vietnam um, era. It's, what was going on was there was a, a political convention. The Republican National Convention was in San Francisco, and it was like Goldwater and Nixon. Um, is that right? Yeah, I think we're, 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 um, uh, we're it being considered. And there was a lot of student protests, as you can imagine. They were signing up students on campus, and the governor uh, said, uh, you know, that's not what you should be doing over there. We just need to put a stop to it. And when they tried, the students had a huge protest. And they said, this violates our free speech. Um, and they did a huge demonstration and, and surrounded a police car at one point, stood up on top of the police car, and shut down the university. And then the, the faculty voted to back the students, and the rest is history. So it's a great, um, it's a great moment. And, um, and Sproul Plaza, interestingly enough, uh, at Berkeley, hasn't changed much. Uh, if you look at the old aerial pictures, it's pretty much the same. So we thought, OK, well, we're in another presidential election uh, in the midst of, this was 2004, October. The, the election was in November. And there's all these political issues going on. There'll be lots of protesting and 
let's put a camera up there. We'll, we'll demonstrate the camera and we'll demonstrate the demonstrations at the same time. So <coughs> we got permission. We put the camera up over the, um, uh, on the student union building. And um, it looks like this. It's very small from the ground. And um, so in other words, you're walking around and you have no idea it's there. Um, and um, we, so we set up this site and we publicized this. We wanted people to know about it. We didn't want it to be secret. Uh, this gives you a little, this is, shows you what the interface looks like. And you can see that it's similar to the other one we had. Again, you have um, uh, a panorama at the bottom. You can look all the way down Spr um, Telegraph Avenue and over here to uh, Sather Gate and then um, all the way back over to um, the Zellerbach Theater. So it's a really big swath of area that you could, you could reach. And you can move around, but you could also, the other key thing is this button where you can capture an image. So you can take a picture of people um, as you're watching them. And then this just gives you a little flavor of the, um, the video. So this is an off the, sh the, the camera part is something we took and then we modified. But um, it's got a very high resolution, um, um, you know, nice response. This is on a, you know, just over a fairly reasonable broadband connection. You're getting about um, six to eight frames a second. And um, you're able to drive it by drawing these frames again on the bottom. And as, the smaller your frame, the more it's zooming in. So you can see, getting kind of close. Um, and you could take pictures and you could post your pictures on the web. So there, there was a, there, it really created um, some response. Um, we put this on, out there. There were a lot of people. Um, you could make comments on pictures and, uh, and, and integrate them. Uh, here's a few examples. And then about a week after we launched this, and it was on the Whitney site in New York, I got it called into the, the call from the chancellor's office said, uh, we'll see you for a meeting at 4 p.m. the next day. Yikes. So it was, um, you know, like getting called into the principal's office. You're, uh, you're, you know, you know you're in trouble. And just trying to figure out, like, well, what is going on? You know, what, how big of a deal is this? So we went in, and there was, uh, I went in, and I, I, was, I was waiting. And I, oh, I see my friend from the um, Student Affairs and Academic Senate, someone from the Legal Affairs. And, and they, they said, OK, come in for the meeting. And they all stood up to go into the same meeting. And I was. So uh, it was a big issue. And they were really worried that we had done something illegal. And so I, I said, this was a work of art. This was something that, that was there to raise awareness and that my job was to make people think. So um, fortunately, that really did strike a chord with the chancellor and the vice chancellor. Some, of, some people had some concerns about um, whether um, you know, I had checked with, um, gotten IRB approval for this. And I, I said, no, I hadn't because it's an artwork which is exempt from IRB, fortunately. Um, but there was a question about whether, you know, if, if you, um, is, it, is it legal strictly? And I had checked with a constitutional attorney who had convinced me, that, uh, had assured me that it was not a problem. But it turned out that it was, there was some question of whether it was legal in California. Because states have their own laws on these kind of things. And in particular, California has uh, anti-paparazzi laws. So there's a law against using a telephoto lens to zoom in and observe somebody through in the private residence. So it turned out that the camera, under certain conditions, lighting conditions, could actually see an apartment building cross uh, Bancroft. And so technically, as soon as we found that out, we restricted so it couldn't do that anymore. But um, that was one. And the other is that when car, you can't take pictures inside a moving car, which is interesting with respect to those traffic cameras I'm talking about. That's illegal too, So because that's considered a private space. So we also had to make sure that the camera couldn't see out um, and onto the street of Bancroft. But more importantly, the chancellor said, look, I don't feel comfortable. You know, I'm really worried about you know, how this could infringe on students. And so we had a good discussion about it. And I agreed that um, I wanted to study it you know, to understand better. So I agreed to reduce the zoom level um, to a medium scale for the duration of the project. And uh, so that would seem to be a reasonable um, understanding. And then we, but, he, he, but with the condition that he lets us increased the maximum zoom on the one day that Howard Dean was coming to campus to do a, a, there was a rally for the anniversary of the free speech movement. So we wanted full zoom on that. He said, okay, if you get the word out. So we just put out, pull out flyers and everything else. And so it was on, it was on full for this day. So you can zoom in like that close uh, to, uh, to Howard Dean's. People are saying it, you can tell if someone's shaved or not from five stories up with this, uh, with this camera. Anyway, I'd be really, um, another thing that positive, I think, that came out of it was we formed a committee. And we started to, uh, working with other 
um, people from a range of different um, other departments uh, and areas, but really to look at this whole question of visual privacy because, interestingly, there was no policy at Berkeley on, um, on privacy. And, um, and I think there's a, this is still an active area. I think, I don't know if Stanford has one, but the question is, if someone puts a camera out of the dorm room, you know, it, who, who's, is there, what's the policy on that? And it doesn't quite fall under security. It doesn't quite fall under experiments. Where does it fall? And I think one thing we came to was that we think it's really important to notify people, that there has to be a central repository where every camera is announced, and it's just someone who's responsible. So if you really don't feel comfortable with it, you can contact them, and you can do something about it. Um, so anyway, we can talk more about this. We're, we, one idea that we came up with was, well, um, let's use technology to actually uh, modify this a little bit, and let's put a, um, uh, these, let's, de let's develop a, uh, this is John Baldessari, an artist, um, still alive, but his idea was he just paint, these are paintings, they're photographs that he took, generic photographs, and he put these dots over people's face, because he wanted to force your eyes, and it's kind of related to our eye motion um, discussion at lunch, he wanted people to look at the things that were less obvious, like not just the face. So he put these dots. Well, we, we thought about this as a way of characterizing privacy. And so we have this project um, we call Respectful Cameras. And what we do is we have a camera that tracks um, not just faces, but we give you a marker, like a scarf or a hat. Um, that's a sort of detachable marker. So when you come into Sproul Plaza, you could take up a hat and you put this on, and then the camera would track you and always um, obscure your face by putting this uh, dot over it. So we have actually a prototype of this. And, um, again, it's opt-in, right? So some people don't care. In fact, we found a very interesting um, generational difference that a lot of people, we said, hey, do you know there's a camera zooming right in on you? And they were like, so? Uh, because if you grew up with camera phones and you know, Flickr and all that stuff, a lot of people didn't care. How many of you care if there's a camera watching you close up? See, that's like us, all, the, all us uh, more senior citizens care. But it's interesting. It's sort of, I, I, I do think there's an interesting study here because it's, it's really is changing. Anyway, so we've been working with, I've been working with um, two law professors uh, at Berkeley, and we had a symposium last year on what we call visual privacy. And uh, so I can talk more about that, too. We're writing an article, and there's a, a blog on this website. If you search under Unblinking, you can get a lot, a lot of details on it. OK. Let's see. I'm going to stop here. I'm going to go to the, uh, no, I have to go quickly through this. Let me see. I'm going to come back and tell you about this in, in, in this, in, using some better slides. But let me go to Ballet Mori. So this is a project we did um, last year to, to, for the anniversary of the free speech movement. No, for the anniversary of the 1906 earthquake. Um, and uh, it was, you know, 1906 was the, the, the big year, the, the, the big one hit San Francisco. And we were interested in the idea of um, doing a, a project that would, that would commemorate that. And so we, um, our idea was to really start to think about the earth more um, as a, in, in a, um, a more broader sense. That, we talk about global networks and all these other things, but we also sometimes forget that we're also dealing with that the Earth is actually interconnected, that we're all on this big, giant mass, and that there interactions occur all the time and have been happening for centuries. Um, and so, for example, when there's an earthquake in Indonesia, it actually can be picked up here, and you, it actually echoes. Um, that travels the speed of sound around the Earth and it keeps going. For, sometimes for months afterwards, it can pick up the echoes. So our idea was to, put, um, to tap into the seismometer and use that to create a soundscape and then have a dancer dance to it. So um, we built this, uh, first we built an interface. And this is online if you go do a search under uh, Mori, M-O-R-I, which um, th you, it'll show you what's happening in, in real time in the Berkeley um, seismometer. And then um, we built a soundscape that you could walk inside and you could experience the sound of the earth. And this was, I worked with a composer who um, basically sonified the signal because it's the, the signals are too low frequency, so we had to use max patch to um, to create a soundscape. And then um, this was this was interesting because this is a shot of the um, city hall, and then right across the street from it is um, the opera house. So we we I got lucky because I I happened to have a friend who knew the um, dancer at the San Francisco Ballet, Muriel Maffrey, who's the one of the top top dancers there, and I I. I talked to her about this, and she loved the idea. She said, I'll do it. And you know, I said, well, remember, it's gonna be, you're going to be out there dancing, and we're not going to know 
five minutes, you know, right up until the second you step on the stage, what's going to happen? Because it's going to depend on the earth. And she was like, no problem. Um, so it was, a, it was very fun. We got to, I got to work with her and a, one of the top choreographers there. And um, I'll show it to you right now. I'll just get, I'm going to show you a three-minute clip. Just um, So um, it was fun. I mean, because it was so nerve-wracking. We had 3,000 people in this uh, auditorium looking for, uh, I mean, and the night, and, you know, as you know, technology always, when there's pressure, is never, is never, um, never does exactly what you want. Okay. So, let's see. Sorry. So I'm just now going to tell you this new stuff we're doing with the biology. So can I get rid of this window, please? <laughs> Horrible. Thank you. Yeah. All right. <laughs> um, all right. So we're, so I'm, st I'm really interested in this idea of the, of the environment. Like I think 99% of the rest of the world these days. But, you know, I think the biggest issue is that we're, it's very hard for us to connect with the environment when we're in the middle of technology or in urban environments, et cetera. So I'm interested in things that let, let us go out and reach them. And we've, we've more recently started a project with field biologists to look at, take these kind of technologies, especially a robotic camera, and develop um, um, systems. And this is kind of, this is, Scott and I are thinking along very similar lines that we can use the techniques to really help biologists because there's a lot of needs out there. And because it's hard work. I mean, if you think it's bad being a computer science student, 
<laughs> try sitting out in some uh, you know remote tundra for 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 eight weeks or something like that. Um, so we wanted to see if robots could help. And um, there's you know this is the year of the robot I should say by the way. Um, hopefully most of you saw the Bill Gates article. Very interesting con set of controversies around that. Um, so this is the argument you saw earlier. The thing I want to talk about is the study that we, we so we got this grant. We started to develop uh, systems around it, but we got very excited because um, I had read in the newspaper about this famous story about the ivory bill woodpecker. And if you don't know about this, how many know about the ivory bill woodpecker and all the controversy around it? Okay, so how many of you are birders? Ah, great. Okay, so birding is a um, huge sport um, in America. Let's see. I'm going to just come back to the cameras. I'm going to skip this step. This is just sort of generally why we're interested in doing this and helping biologists. But I think if you're, you're familiar with what Scott's doing, you, you know these arguments. Um, oh, and I'm going to, sorry, I'm going to skip this too. Sorry. That's what you get for editing your slides at the two minutes before the talk. OK. Come on. So what I'm interested in, though, is this, uh, is this bird feeder. Uh, I mean, sorry, this, this particular bird. And I should mention, I've also um, been doing some work with Bob Full who's a biology professor and very interested in robotics at Berkeley. Um, now, the ivory bill woodpecker is this phenomenal story. Uh, it's the, this bird is the kind of bird that people um, have spend their lives looking for. And the reason, it, it's, it's, it's kind of like the, um, you know, the holy grail of, of bird watching. Um, and it, there's huge interest in it. Um, it's kind of like the, um, the Black Orchid and the Loch Ness Monster and uh, SETI uh, all rolled into one, right? There's something out there we think. We really believe it, but we're not sure where it is. Um, and <clears throat> of course, sometimes these searches pay off, right? So last year, there was this you know, legendary giant squid, and they actually got pictures of it. Um, so um, and in this category, there's a lot of people interested in this. Um, you know, I don't know how many people believe in UFOs, per se, but how many people are into um, birders? Birds. It's a huge population. Not so many on the coast, but more in the middle. Um, and uh, this one is is just the, probably the most, the single most um, talked about bird. And the reason is, um, well, it hasn't been spotted since 1945. And I'll just tell you. Oh, I think it's also very related to all kinds of. There's all kinds of spiritual aspects around it too, because there's you know the famous birds of Phoenix and um, Messiah, et cetera. All, it is all like a lot of backstory behind this bird. But there really was such a bird. And we know that because in 1938, this guy, uh, James Tanner, uh, went out and documented a small family of these birds um, in southern, southern United States. And he took the top um, Hollywood film crew with him. So they have very high quality recordings and video and, and film uh, footage of this bird. So there's no doubt it did exist. The big problem is we don't think it's, we had no, nobody's taken a, a definitive photo of this bird since 1944. And there's all kinds of things been written about them. I mean, they're magnificent. They're big, you know, 20, um, uh, 19 inches tall with like a 30-inch wingspan. And they said when you saw this bird, you would exclaim, Lord God. Uh, and the um, problem is that they were, they, were, they were very prized when they were still fairly common, and they were hunted down. So they were poached by uh, trophy hunters. And um, also, it turns out, when I've gotten a whole bunch of books on this bird, and the Nazis are even involved. Because um, when we captured um, German uh, prisoners in World War II, they were sent to um, uh, these uh, uh, um, prisons, essentially, in the South. And then one of the things they had to do was to help clear the forests. So the other big problem is there's been lots of clearing of the natural habitat of this bird. So um, it's, the story is, the reason it's so resonant and so American in some degree is that it's really about endangered species and the, the future of progress. Um, so, uh, it wasn't until 73 that we have an Endangered Species Act. And, could, and they'll talk a lot about this because it's all about conservation, and it's about the idea that um, you know, the, the natural um, area, range of this bird has been restricted so far since 1885, over the last century. Um, now the question is, OK, well, if there's, so in other words, if there's still one or a couple of them out there, it's a big deal. Like, maybe we've managed to keep this bird alive. And the question, so, um, and of course, this is a famous line that we need to observe to know. And this comes back to the telepistemology. And another aspect of this is that there's, two, there's another bird that's very similar. 
um, an ivory pileated woodpecker. Now, to a casual eye like mine, these, these are pretty much the same, right? But they're all the difference. This one has a white beak. That's why we call it ivory bill. And it, look at the patterns on the back wing, the trailing white down here. So it's, it turns out that this is a very rare and magnificent bird, and this is very common, not a big deal. Um, there's been a lot of sightings over the years. So lots of people, now, you can imagine, right? They probably see a pileated, they get excited, they think it's an ivory bill, they make a report. Um, the story is, though, that the real ivory bill is very, very rare. And um, this, is a, this is a world expert in this area. And he said, I'll believe it when I get a detailed, high-resolution video. Um, now, oh, so the story just, uh, this is, I can't, I can't help getting excited about this. This is a guy who's out, he's a bird expert. He's out rowing his kayak in, um, about three years ago. And by his account, a giant ivory bill flies right at him. He gets a great view of him. He circles around. He's, he looks at it with amazement. And then it, it flies off. And he is just stunned. It's like a life-changing experience. He goes back. He doesn't want to tell anybody because he's not sure if they'll believe him, etc. Finally, he tells somebody. Cornell sends down two world experts to, uh, to uh, check it out. It's this little backward town of Arkansas. And these two guys, who are real experts, they see it too. And they draw it. This is what birders do. They when they see something, they each pull out and start drawing notes and everything else. And then they compare later. And they say, yeah, that was it. It has the tail feathers. So now, Cornell s spends a million dollars to launch a massive um, hunt to find this bird. And they get volunteers. And it's all secret. So they don't want anybody to know because all the, these bird watching nuts will come in there and um, to spoil the area. So, so, but you, but, so here's the situation. You're in the middle of the swamp. And it's very... You know, your eyes can deceive you. Things happen, right? You're in the middle of nowhere. Um, it's a tricky problem. This gentleman, um, David Luno, who's also a computer scientist, as it turns out, but, but an avid bird, bird um, expert, he's out there one day and, with, and has a video camera on the back of his, um, um, his um, uh, uh, canoe, and he spots this thing. Now, I'm going to show you this video. Just a little clip he sent me. OK, now um, watch closely. This is um, right around here. Oh, there it is. This is the only video ever taken. And um, this has probably been analyzed. I mean, this is about 14 pixels of, <laughs> of bird. It's been analyzed more than the Zapruder film. Um, it's an amazingly um, uh, interesting story because it gets published in science. So in uh, June of 2005, they come out with an announcement. The ivory bill is still, it persists. And this creates a huge response. It's on the front page of the New York Times. It's, a, it's 60 minutes, covers it. Um, but then um, there's, there's a big problem because uh, a bunch of people come back and say, no, we don't believe. That is not good enough for us because it could be the affiliated. Or, you know. And then they, they also said that there were sound recordings. But it turned out there were blue jays in the area. And they had played the sound, the recorded sounds, and blue jays are mimics. So they don't believe that, that the sound was, was real either. So that's where we called them up and said, hey, we're developing these robotic cameras. What about if we come down there? And they said, get on a plane. Get over here. So um, we went out, and we set up this, uh, we, you know, they took us around to show us what was, uh, what was going on out there. It was much too cold for me. Um, but one of the ideas that the principal of that direct, the director of the Cornell lab said was, well, the, we, know, we think it's flying up and down this giant um, habitat of, wild, of, of forest. And there's a power line that cuts right between it at a nice little neck. It's about 900 yards wide. If I were going to put a camera somewhere, I'd put it right there. Because that's probably, you know, it's going to have to cross this periodically. So um, this is an aerial view. That's what it looks like from the ground. So we set out to do it. And Des and I, or Des Song, my student, um, we spent a lot of time sort of planning, designing this thing. We got a camera, high resolution video camera. Um, we decided the, the best place for it, all, all these other aspects, and then started designing a system that could, could basically sit in a swamp for um, extended periods. And the idea here is this. We don't have network out there, so we, 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 we need to have um, the camera um, uh, doing some filtering on the fly in real time. So it's going to be recording images constantly. And then it's going to throw away everything that might not be a bird. Um, and uh, so, you know, and it's, and, oh, the, and, and the other thing is, how do we, we get information? We have to have a guy row a boat out there every three to four weeks. And he pulls out the disk drive and puts in a new disk drive. 
So it's very low res uh, communication medium. The other biggest problem was power. And we had, you know, it's a power line, so I thought, oh, no problem, you know. <laughs> well, 69 kilovolts. So uh, we, uh, we, had to, we talked to them, and they said, well, we can do a step-down transformer. It's $50,000, and then plus we have to bring a team in there. And after a lot of negotiation, they basically donated it to the project, which was really wonderful. So they came out and built a huge transformer at that site, sort of step-down transformer, so that there's a plug at the bottom, and we could plug in. So this was the design. Um, and then there's some, um, there's some uh, motion, uh, motion detection. We do some pretty much state-of-the-art um, ideas of background modeling with statistical modeling. So every, every pixel we have a statistical model. We look for outliers. And then we do um, uh, collected components, connected components, to see if it's, out, if it's a big enough clump of outliers. And then we do another thing, which is we, 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 we check if that clump of outliers is moving fast enough. Because if it's not, it could be a lot of other things like clouds or just other phenomena out there. So we experimented with a lot of, uh, of the parameters, the motion, motion detection um, thing. But this is the outcome of the first trial, which we got lots of pictures of birds. Um, <clears throat> we just had this up at, over Texas, um, the collaborators at Texas A&M. And uh, you know, over the course of the summer, we got not lots of nice images. Um, and then we went out to put this out there. And uh, it was, uh, you can see the conditions are not so great. Um, this was the day that the, 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 the guys came out to put the uh, power line, and it was pouring rain. And they had to shut down power to the entire city of Brinkley to install this. Not, not exactly endearing us to the, uh, to the local city members. But now there it is. So it's, we've got the two, a pair of cameras, one facing one way along the power line cut, the other facing the other. Um, and they're running around the clock. So they, I, I should say, no, they, they wake up in the morning, and they run until night. And, um, so here's the results. We, uh, we're, we're now posting the first couple of months of results. And um, by that, I mean we take the data out and we, um, we upload it onto the network. And then a team from um, locally, Arkansas and, and Cornell, evaluates it first. And then they, they, they release it to us. These are some of the best images we've gotten. Um, this, uh, the first time, this is one of the first ones right after we installed it. Um, when I saw this, I was like, my god, we've got a pterodactyl. Uh, <laughs> and uh, the, the, um, you know, it's, it, it is a pretty good sequence of shots. I mean, that's actually not at the full resolution that, it, um, that it's capturing it at. Um, this is another shot from that uh, uh, about a month later. Um, and this is my favorite so far. Uh, that's a red-tailed hawk, but just because the light is just right, and the, you know, if we, if that, so the uh, the Cordell team said, look, if you, if that, if the ivory bill woodpecker flies by and you get an image like that, that's a million-dollar image, and they also said, it, there's a protocol that if we have that discovery, Laura Bush is the, makes the announcement. So <laughs> I was like, okay. <laughs> So, because there's a lot at stake. There's a whole bunch of uh, fish and what U.S. fish and wildlife. A whole bunch of people are involved in this search, and they have rules about how they're going to release the information when it comes out. Anyway, this is from December, but it's, it's been running. It's still online. I'm happy to say it's been running pretty well since since then. Um, how well though is re is relative? I mean, we're 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 only saving about six at this point about one one frame in every ten thousand that's re being recorded. We're tossing everything else out. But even among those. Um, there's only about 3% of those contain birds. So um, you know, lots of false positives. It turns out this is still manageable. So we have a team of volunteers who basically go through all the video we get, and they ca classify it if it's a bird or not, and if it is a bird, what kind of bird. And these guys are so good, they immediately can tell what kind of bird it is. Um, but then um, you know, we're waiting. So, and we did get the, a couple pileated, uh, shots of the pileated, the cousin of this, that are online. OK, so there's lots of, uh, of additions and things. And one of the things we're very excited about right now is we're, gonna, we're working right now to put wireless networking out there, so to beam out live network. And I'm hoping that we'll have that running by the end of the summer, and we'll be able to let the public share and go in. But in the meantime, what we've done, let me see if I have anything else here. Um, good, so let me stop this, and I'll show you our newest fun project, which is um, we will, yes. Working play into the protocol for the announcement. Mm. Good question. That's a that's a tricky one. One of the things we're, we're thinking is that we're going to use wireless networking to update our access to them. We'll do a pre-screen filter, 
But the Cornell team says we might give the, the public a slightly lower resolution images. So if someone did see a candidate, they'd alert us, then we could act, look at the high res image. So, but it's a good question, right? Um, do we want some, you know, kid in, uh, you know, Pennsylvania making a big discovery? Um, so, but I think that the idea of the kid in Pennsylvania, we are interested in engaging them in the public in these kind of searches and being aware of the of the of the environment and working with field biologists. So we just set up this um, site um, and announced this about two weeks ago, and this is a this is a telerobotic camera system. It's very similar to the the framework that you saw before, but we've we've improved, made a number of improvements. So it's um, it's much better quality, much more responsive. And it, um, it also lets, it's, it's a game, so you can, uh, you get points by taking pictures of birds. So right now you can see up here in the upper right that there's about um, 2,600 players have, uh, have registered um, on the site. And actually I can refresh this because this page was sitting up here. Still connected? Come on. Um, so we launched it and it got, it got a lot of attention because it's at uh, Craig's house from Craigslist. So you see, we got two more players since I was talking, and there's about 5,000 um, photos have been taken. Um, I'll log into the site. Um, so I welcome you to join. In fact, I would love your you guys to to try it out. It's, you just um, go to the site. You get a you get a password, and then um, you can play. And the idea is that um, come on when this loads, you'll see a live image of the of the what the camera's seeing, and then you also get a, um, um, access to, you can take photos of these birds, and then you can also get access to um, other people's photos, and you can classify them. And it's a little like Louis Von, Louis Von On's um, ESP game, where it's based on how well, um, if you, we need to have at least three people. Um, of course this would happen. There we go. Just as I hit, let's see if that. Um, um, and I'm excited about the idea of the game because I found that w by introducing a little scoring aspect, people really got engaged to it in a different way. There are people, as I mentioned earlier, who are really spending a huge amount of time on this because it kind of intersects the computer gaming. You know, there's a, a lot of people doing computer games and a lot of people doing um, who are interested in birds. And that intersection is very intense. And those, they're, they're spending a lot of time out there uh, developing this. And, um, and it's teaching people, I think, about birds to some degree. Actually, there's one right there. So you can see a bird um, moving around. So these people are online right now. There's like four, only four of us right now. But we're all sharing the camera using this interface down here at the bottom. And um, they're going to, and it, you, can, you can zoom in. So what I try and do here is uh, draw frame. Oh, look at that red-headed thing. Um, let's see. So then you can zoom over here. To, there you go. So that's a good shot of this bird here. And then you can take a picture if you, if you like it. It, doesn't, it, should, it should be out of focus. So um, the only reason it's out of focus there is because it wasn't close in enough. Here, let's see. So um, this is not, it's a little bit overcast in San Francisco. It's not a perfect day to do it. But we've been getting um, some really beautiful weather in the last two weeks. So there's been like, I see lots of birds, sometimes squirrels out there and all kinds of stuff. Um, well, actually, the best thing I find is that um, over here uh, is a little patch. We put up a little thing for um, uh, the kind of plant that I was told attracts um, hummingbirds. And I uh, thought, well, hummingbird, you know, just seeing a hummingbird is almost impossible in real life, right? Catching it with the camera and zooming in and everything, like, very unlikely. But um, you go to the public gallery. So this is where the 5,000 images are. And then we take a picture of under the Anna, Anna's hummingbird. These are pictures that have been categorized as hummingbird. I can't even see that well, but let's see. I think this is a good one. Um, there's like 25 pictures of hummingbirds. Yeah, there. It's, it's, it's hard to see here, but it's a pretty clear image of a hummingbird. 
So the people are out there really getting images. A guy from Arkansas said, I didn't know there was a um, wood-headed grosbeak or something like that uh, out there. And so people are actually taking it seriously as a way of categorizing what kind of uh, birds are out there. Are you, are you familiar with these kind of matters? Okay, uh, but you can see here that you get to um, you get to classify. So if you disagree with this, you might say it's a um, uh, a Stellar's J, and so we use some um, uh, uh, you know you can you can, I get to try and classify this, and then my classification will go in there. And if it agrees with other people's classifications, then I'll get points, etc. And I'll just show you. So anyway, but I encourage you. I'd love you guys to um, to try it out, and it's kind of fun. And we're now getting some interest in maybe putting one in, in Rwanda and look at some um, gorillas and things like that. So um, stay tuned. Thanks. Okay. Question? Yes. On the Arkansas project, yes. uh, can you uh, decide on the focus and the, the shutter speed? No. Um, well, well, we can we set the um, iris control, the shutter speed, and the general field of view that we, with the lens, we get to pick. But we only do that once. We don't, it's not c controllable remotely. So for 10 birds that pass, how many do you think you actually get? Ah, good. So you're asking about the false negative. Right, right. Um, because your yeah, speed is Exactly. So it's hard to know. But one of the things we, 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 um, we did was a uh, ground truth thing. So we had a guy standing right there watching how many birds came by. And then we compared what we were capturing. And again, we have something like uh, under 10%. I mean, we're, we're missing birds. So, and there's a couple of reasons. Birds are, 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 are flying you know, um, sort of too far away, so we consider them too small. Um, or there's um, some because the lighting conditions are, we, we, because we're getting lots of false positives, that the, that the system is not as responsive to that. So, these are exactly the kind of things we need to be working on. And part of the idea, and this comes back to wide networking, is that we'll be able to get images, and then we'll be able to update those parameters remotely, too. And then we also like to put more cameras out there. Because you're right, right now we're not able to really cover that full 900 yards. Just with this, too, it's probably about 200 yards we're able to get on either side. Scott? So uh, this bird project is really interesting because you've got people and computers working together try and solve this one task of finding you. Know, we want to find the bird. Yeah. And you know, computers are doing their best to help out by throwing out a bunch of the, the non-interesting images. And people are then looking at a bunch of them. And it's it, I mean, this is kind of reshaping interactive systems in a lot of ways. And I think we're, as computer vision and other technologies of that ilk become more useful, I think we're going to see this more and more. And I guess my question was about how one designs that genre of interaction. And I mean, I was surprised. I, I, I often take the more Google view of like, heck, just save every image and tag. You know, you could imagine a, uh, tag, saving every frame and tagging each frame with a odds that there's a bird in it, where for some it might be like 0.99, and for others it might be you know, six zeros and then one. Mm -hmm. And just having people look at them from most to least. In fact, you could even have the, the, you know, the mm -hmm. amateurs on the internet get high res versions of the ones where we're pretty sure there's no bird. Right. But heck, if they want to look at it, that's their thing. Oh, that's interesting. Okay. Um, and I was just curious about how you design these kinds of things and make those kinds of decisions. That's an, I, OK, so I, you know, you're a really good designer, so you thought of this differently. I think that's actually nice that um, you know if we really are able to keep a lot of them, um, and we hopefully we'll get to that point when we have this wireless network, then we could um, do some really simple image processing over them and put them out to this archive, right? Because also now we have to do image processing on the fly in the swamp, but once we can upload them, then we can do much more sophisticated things, and then we could give limit different kinds of access. And you're right that once, why not bring it all out? And then let's really let people go in there and look through it. Because you know, it's kind of an exciting idea that, I mean, as you say, we're missing, we have false negatives. We're missing stuff that's actually happening out there. If we could bring it all in and then let people really pour through it, it's kind of exciting because then everything's out there, right? And it's fascinating to me that, for example, amateur astronomers 
are making major discoveries and you know, really important uh, observations. So why couldn't we do this in, in nature? Really open it up. And by the way, the, the fun is, you, you get satisfaction, even, not necessarily if you find that, 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 but just the look, you know, the hunt is very exciting. And if you get kids, you know, uh, students and, and people involved, then they're engaged. And then the other idea is that you know, they'll, be, they'll care, they'll want to you know, vote appropriately for conservation and other things about uh, policy. Um, so, and, and I think that it's, it is really interesting, you're right about the, the trade-offs, because getting the right balance, because if, if a game just seems hopeless, like the odds of winning are so low, then nobody wants to play. You've got to have reward. So maybe another idea might be that we give some kind of score that gets rated by other people in the game based on other images you find. So if someone did dig up that red-tailed hawk image, they get some points for that. Right? It's not the ivory build. But it's something interesting, and that gets more people, more eyeballs in there. It gets people to play with it. So, um, yeah, I think there's a lot of room there. And by the way, I should say the scoring method we have for the other camera, the Cone Sutra Forest camera, is also there's some we have a, there's a, a guy who's got a blog where he reverse engineered our cone our, our scoring system, and he basically came out with a whole bunch of suggestions for improving it. <laughs> so we actually said join this team, and so we, he's gonna he's gonna we're gonna work with him this summer. Other question? You all, I know you all want to run back and try the system. Right. <laughs> yeah. Oh, <laughs> there we go. By what? What is that? Uh, gross, gross peak. That's a gross peak? Uh, here's our, oh, I don't, I don't want to restart this because it's always a pain to get that Java applet. But yeah, then you go to the, um, if you went to the public gallery, you can see some images of that, and then you could check if it were here right or not. Yeah. Scott's question. It seems like you must have had to set a few thresholds in your in your um, bird detection algorithm, like the level of motion and the size of the connected components and stuff like that. So presumably, the higher you set the thresholds, the fewer false positives you get. But the more that you'll miss real birds, the lower you set it, the more false positives you get, and the longer you can, humans will have to comb through this yeah. data. So did you set that threshold based on sort of the amount of data storage that you had available, or were there other considerations, or how did you s settle on that threshold? Somewhat trial and error because when the system that we had up in um, Texas, we just we tuned those parameters while we had the whole system, you know, right above the computer science building, and um, yeah, we aimed it toward. We have 300 gigabytes of storage, and we wanted that to last about a month, so that was what our, that was our constraint. Um, but that's, you know, one one thing we found was that there were a lot of leaves blowing around because um, it was uh, fall, and so we got lots of false positives from that. So it was very hard to you know, the two environments were different. So, yeah, we really want to be able to fine tune that and maybe, and change those parameters, you know, at different times of day and different, because there's also certain periods with lots of birds um, migrating. And so you probably want to, you know, increase the, um, or reduce the, the, the or you want to get more bird shot. You want to take, you want to be a little more sensitive during times when there's lots of birds going by, because that could be more activity. So, um, that's the next step. And I'd really like to, really like to explore it. But you're absolutely right. There's, there's like 10 magic numbers in there. And those are all little knobs we can, we, we want to play with. Vastly improved bird detection algorithm later on. You have all this data that you can That's run. Right. Through. Yeah. yeah. And another thing, you know, another open source aspect of this is, and I, I'm, I'm, I like the idea, is taking a big swath of like a day's worth of just the raw video and putting it out on the web and saying, hey, can you do better? If anybody has a better algorithm, you know, we'll work with you. Because that, that would be great. So then everybody can just try and run their algorithms over the same uh, block of data. Do what? Can this Google to put a data center out there? Have, can it's Google? You know them over there, right? Um, yeah, no, I, uh, we, we actually had one. Uh, Southern California has a supercomputer center who said that they would, they would store big blocks of the data. And they have the wire, um, fiber optic network to transfer it around. So yeah, I like that, that idea. Yeah. We have the 69 kilovolts. <laughs> OK. Oh, well, one more question. Yeah. Yeah, since you're, since you're trying to detect something that's never been successfully detected before, did you create models or fake uh, birds or something to test out your system? Because it seems like you know, a tremendous challenge. Oh, I'm sorry. And I should have been more clear. We, we're not, we're, we are, you're right, because trying to actually detect the ivory bill versus other birds is really hard. 
And we didn't even try that. We are just taking anything that looks like a bird, and then we let a human make that determination. But that would be a good, someone has said that too, that it would be really interesting to train these systems, because now once we're tagging all this data, we have all the metadata, we could run it through a classifier and then have a system that would automatically know certain categories of birds. So that would be, that's another future work. So if you're looking for a PhD topic, be a good one. Okay. Also, you know, I don't know if you've, you've tried this, but depending on the spin, oh, you yeah, will right. see certain birds that you will not otherwise. Oh, yeah. So the, the capture aspect, I think, in itself is quite... I should mention, that someone from the military came to one of the talks and said that he wanted to um, get, get a radar system out there. <laughs> so that we'd radar detect it, and so it's like, oh, that's getting a little... You must have made a lot of overlap with security. Oh, yeah, so I don't know what's out there, because it... I think that you know there are there are lots of cases that look for like motion in airports and things like that, and so and of course this probably is useful. Someone said, you know, well, you know, maybe there's an UFO out there. You'll catch that. Um, so yeah, if um, monitoring the skies, probably other people are interested in that too. For sure. All right. Thank you. Thank you. For information on other online Stanford seminars and courses, please visit study.stanford.edu. The preceding program is copyrighted by Stanford University. Please visit us at stanford.edu.